We've looked at describing the input-output behavior of linear time invariant systems using difference equations, using the impulse response and convolution, and also using the frequency response. There's one additional description based on the system function that is very insightful, and particularly when we look at the poles and zeros of the system function. Recall that the frequency response was defined by applying a complex sinusoid e to the j omega n as the input to our linear time invariant system, and then the output is just the complex sinusoid at the same frequency times the frequency response of the system. We called h of e to the j omega frequency response. Well, we're going to generalize this input. We're going to define a complex number z to be magnitude r and phase omega. So we can write that as r e to the j omega. And then if I look at a signal, z raised to the nth power, that's going to be r to the n e to the j omega n. So this is like a complex sinusoid here, and then we're modulating that or multiplying that by r to the n. If we illustrate this, we're going to have a damped sinusoid. There's this exponential damping that takes the shape of r to the n. In the case we've drawn here, r is less than 1, so that as n gets big, this number gets smaller and smaller. And then we have some oscillations at frequency omega. Now this number, which characterizes this particular input, this damped input, can be represented in something called the z-plane. And I can write that as a point in the z-plane where I've got the real part of z on the horizontal axis, the imaginary part of z on the vertical axis. So this point has a magnitude or length from the origin r and an angle omega. So if I apply this input z to the n, which is a little more general than my original sinusoidal input, it turns out that I get as an output z to the n, but it's multiplied by a complex number h of z. We call h of z the system function, or sometimes people use the term transfer function. Now if I take the convolution expression and I substitute for x my input z to the n, with a little bit of algebra I can rewrite y of n as z to the n times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity h of k times z to the minus k. This infinite sum, it turns out, is my system function h of z. And it also turns out that h of z is the z transform of h of k. Now we're not going to talk a lot about z transforms in this particular lecture because our focus is on maintaining a fairly high level. Now there's a relationship, as you might expect, between the frequency response and the system function because of the similarity in the inputs that are represented. You notice that if r is equal to 1, then z to the n is just e to the j omega n, because z is e to the j omega. So the frequency response, h of e to the j omega, can be expressed as the system function, h of z, evaluated at z equals e to the j omega. And if I go back to my z plane, what I've found is that when the magnitude of z is 1, in other words, r is 1, that's a special place in the z plane, because on this so-called unit circle, where magnitude of z is 1, the frequency response is obtained from the system function. So the system function exists for any value of z, but we get the frequency response when we evaluate the system function on this unit circle. Now we're particularly interested in the system function for difference equations. And the reason for this is because this is the most common form we're going to look at when we design filters. So if we have a difference equation that says the sum of a k times past values of the output is equal to the sum over k of b k times past values of the input. It's not too difficult, but a little bit of algebra gives you that the system function corresponding to this difference equation is a ratio of polynomials in z inverse. In the numerator we have the sum from k equals 0 to m b k z to the minus k and then in the denominator, we have the sum from k equals 0 to n, a k, z to the minus k. So we define some special values of z using the terminology poles and zeros. A pole occurs when h of z approaches infinity or blows up. 
And that clearly is going to occur at any values of z for which the denominator is zero. Turns out there's some other cases that you can also get poles. For example, if b0 is zero, then the first term in the numerator involves a z inverse. So z equals zero could be a pole as well. Now zeros are said to occur when h of z equals zero. So in this case, the numerator polynomial, when that goes to zero, we get a zero. Now the reason for the name zeros is obvious. The reason for the name poles comes from the fact that if I visualize, I can think of the magnitude of h of z as a surface. And if I take like a sheet and stick a tent pole up under that surface, that's the kind of shape that you get in the vicinity of these poles. Obviously, it would have to be an infinitely long tent pole to drive the value of h of z up to infinity. Now, it's useful then to express the system function in terms of these poles and zeros. And we can do that by factoring the numerator polynomial and factoring the denominator polynomial. So we're going to factor this in the form where we have a product of terms that are 1 minus ck z inverse. And since I've got a product of m terms and the constant term is always 1 in that product, then that's going to give me the z to the 0 term. So I need a b0 in front of that. And similarly, in the denominator, I'm going to factor out a0 and write this polynomial as a product from k equals 1 to n, 1 minus dk z inverse. So this factorization, that as I've written it, relies on neither b0 nor a0 being equal to 0. Well, the ck are known as zeros because they're the roots of the numerator polynomial at those values. When z is equal to ck, then I have 1 minus ck times ck inverse, and that's going to be 1 minus 1, or 0. Similarly, the dk are known as poles, and those are the values where h of z blows up. We depict poles and zeros graphically using symbols. We'll use a little circle for 0 and a little x for poles, and we can sketch their locations in the z-plane. For example, as I've shown here, where I've got a pair of poles at this location, and then I've got a pair of zeros, and then another zero on the real axis. The location of these poles and zeros actually tells us a lot about the behavior of the system. Let's take a little example here. We'll have a second order difference equation that's y of n minus 3 eighths y of n minus 1 minus 7 sixteenths y of n minus 2 is equal to x of n plus x of n minus 2. What we want to do is take this system, find the system function h of z, and then the poles and the zeros. Well, it's fairly easy to identify the coefficients of the various terms in the difference equation. We have that a0 is 1, a1 is negative 3 eighths, similarly a2 is negative 7 sixteenths. Then on the right side, we have b0 is 1, there's no x of n minus 1 term, so b1 has to be 0. And then finally, the coefficient of x of n minus 2 is b2, and that's going to be 1. So I can write down the system function as this ratio of polynomials in z inverse. I'll have 1 plus z to the minus 2. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have 1 minus 3 eighths z inverse minus 7 sixteenths z to the minus 2. Now to find the poles and zeros, I'm going to factor both the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. I can write the numerator as 1 plus j z inverse times 1 minus j z inverse. In the denominator, I can also factor that as 1 minus 7 eighths z inverse times 1 plus 1 half z inverse. So we see that the poles of the system are the roots of the denominator, and those are given by 7 eighths and negative one half, because when z takes either of those values, the denominator goes to zero. And then the zeros occur at plus or minus j. Here we've sketched those locations in the z-plane, and I've shown the unit circle, the magnitude of z equals one. And then here's a pole at z equals minus one half, another pole at z equals seven eighths, and then I have my zeros at z equals plus j and z equals minus j. And the fact that the coefficients a k and b k are real implies that your poles and zeros occur in conjugate pairs, because the roots of polynomials with real coefficients must occur in complex conjugate pairs. Now the pole and zero locations 
give us a lot of insight about the behavior of the system. We're not going to show this, but it turns out that if your system is going to be stable and causal, what we mean by a stable system is that if I put an input with bounded amplitude, that the output will always have bounded amplitude. Well, a system will be stable if all the poles are inside the unit circle. In other words, the magnitude of all the poles has to be less than one. The poles and zeros also tell us a lot about the response time of the system. In this case, the poles are particularly insightful. So if I have a system that's at rest at time n equals zero, and that basically means there's no stored energy in the system, the, the past values of the outputs are all zero, then the response of that system to some input at time n equals zero takes the form sum k equals one to n of coefficients alpha k times dk raised to the nth power plus a steady state term which tells us how the system responds to the input after the input's been there for a long time. In other words, all the transient effects have died out. So this first term here represents the transient effects and it involves the poles raised to powers. And these coefficients are depending on a lot of factors, but the key thing is that dk to the n is something that we can understand how it behaves. In particular, if you have a dk that has a small magnitude, in other words, it's close to the origin, then when I raise that dk to a power, it's going to decay to zero very quickly. For example, if the magnitude of dk is 0.1, then dk squared is 0 0.01, dk cubed is 0 0.001, and this term dies out very quickly. On the other hand, if dk has a magnitude close to unity, then this term is going to last for a lot of values of n. So if dk is, say, 0.99, then for n equals 2, I have 0.99 squared, and then 0.99 cubed, and so on. And it takes quite a few values of n, then, for that term to die down to a very small factor. So what this tells us, since this represents the transient effects of the system transitioning from zero energy, or being at rest, to a steady state behavior, that if you have poles near z equals zero, your system is going to have a fairly fast response time. But poles near z equals one result in a fairly slow transient response. Now the third factor that poles and zeros tell us a lot about is the frequency response. And it turns out that the frequency of the response of the system can be interpreted as based on the distance between the pole zero locations and the unit circle. And I'm talking specifically here about the magnitude of the frequency response. We will look at the relationship between the magnitude response and the poles and zero locations in great detail in another lecture. Basically, what happens is that poles near the unit circle push the response up, while zeros near the unit circle pull the response down. So from the pole and zero locations, you can get a very good idea of what the magnitude response of the system looks like. So the poles and zeros are very useful and informative characterization for linear time-invariant systems.